Thank you very much. It's a huge, huge pleasure to be here. I've never actually been to Schumacher College before, so I'm feeling I'm on hallowed ground and very excited to be here. And even I admit I've never even been to Totnes before. So it's very exciting terrain of the world to enter. Um, yeah, a real pleasure to be here. Now, I would like to invite you to join a guerrilla campaign to rewrite economics. And all you need to bring is a pen. I will bring the donuts if you bring the pens. That's the deal. So I'm going to tell you about donuts and uh, how we can lightly but firmly rewrite economics. So it's, it's what, October? It's that back to school time of year. And I'm thinking about all the students going to school and going to university and studying, filling their minds with the knowledge they need for their future careers. And I'm particularly thinking about the economic students going to universities all over the world, in Berlin, in London, Plymouth, Southampton, Chengdu, you know, you name it. Students going to learn economics. And I'm thinking of this bunch of students particularly because they are the students who are going to be the policy makers in the policy making positions in the decades, say, 2030 to 2050. Decades in which we know is a time when, you know, this little graph here that tells us at the moment we are living as if we have one and a half planets to live off. And we're heading, if we keep going that direction, we're going to end up living on more than two and a half, maybe three planets. And of course, there aren't two and a half, three planets out there. We need to come back within this one. So there's this incredible transition down to this one planet living required between now and 2050. So these economic students, you know, we know economics is a language which frames policymaking. is so powerful in public discourse, in the media, in parliaments. In our, in our lives, in the, in the way we talk about the healthy economy, it really matters what their minds are being filled with and the constructs that they're learning, if they're going to do a good job of being part of the community that brings us down here. If, you're, if your child was going to school and coming home with a textbook saying, you know, this is what I learned about Earth, you'd be pretty worried, right, if they were using this textbook, because we know it, it actually looks something more like that. Um, subtle change about the positioning of Earth in relation to the Sun, but fundamentally important. Fundamentally important shift of paradigm and perception. I studied economics at university 20 years ago, so I was one of those students. And when I look at the textbooks they're studying now, I'm amazed that despite all the challenges we face, and indeed despite many of the advances that have been made in lots of different fields of economics, they're still studying practically the same books, the same theories that I learned, and they're studying this Nope, they're studying this, they're studying this. They're studying almost like the geocentric. We haven't made the flip to understanding that we're not at the centre of the universe. Economics is still in the old paradigm, and that's a real problem. Now, if you haven't done an economics degree, I'm going to save you the time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's in it. If you were to open a macroeconomics textbook, you'd very quickly find this diagram, the circular flow of goods and money. And what it shows is we've got households and we've got firms, and households sell their labour to firms, and in return, they get wages, and they, they lend money to firms, or they invest in their shares, and they get dividends. And with that money, they spend it on the things that the firms are making, and they get goods and services. So here we've got the resources going round and round, the labour for the goods, the labour for the goods, and here we've got the money going round, wages spending, wages spending. And that's the circular flow of goods and money. That's at the heart of every textbook. And that diagram really matters because even though it looks incredibly simple, I think it goes in very, very quietly, very subtly into the back of an economist's head. So subtly that you don't even know it's there anymore, but it frames your worldview. And it's fundamentally wrong in at least three ways. There are three major things missing from it. One, the economy is not floating on a white background. <laughs> it is deeply embedded in the environment. And it's not closed. It's drawing in natural resources and putting out pollutants. And it needs to be situated in that environment, which is based on solar energy coming in from the sun and waste heat going out. So suddenly we've got a completely different question. Wow, how big can the economy be in relation to the environment? If you don't have that in your picture, you can't ask the question. I was never asked to ask that question during my degree. But it becomes obvious if you take a sort of ecological economics approach. And then secondly, we can say, yes, you know, work done in the paid economy matters, but a lot of the work that matters in our lives is in the unpaid economy. So here we've got caring labour in the home, raising the next generation of workers. It's actually, you know, all the work that parents put into raising their kids actually is, in a way, a subsidy to businesses. Here is the next generation of workers for you. 
Uh, and that's totally unpaid. And this woman's got a bucket on her head because in many developing countries, women are providing not only the meals on the table, but also the water, the firewood. So many of the essential goods and services that make up a family's well-being are actually outside of the market economy. So if you ignore that, if you say, hmm, that's feminist economics, <laughs> you know, I think that's a bit um, heterodox for us. If you ignore that, you are ignoring the work of a vast majority of parents and many women in the world, which is fundamental to our well-being, but lies outside the monetary economy. And then thirdly, a lot of exchange goes on that's not actually in the market economy, but it's social exchange, whether it's from the micro of babysitting circles, doing babysitting swaps with your neighbours, or even the creation of Wikipedia. Goods and services that we create and we share, art and music, all the things we do with each other, that are, lie outside the monetized economy. Again, essential to our well-being. If you ignore it, you are missing half of what human life is about. So there's a much fuller picture that you can start to ask more interesting questions about the way the economy interacts with human prosperity and the, and the wider notion of our well-being. But it's complex. And it's hard to find metrics for all of it. So mainstream economics says, well, let's just use it anyway. Let's go ahead. But when I take away those things, you can feel the loss of so much of our story. You can feel the loss of a lot of the things that matter to us. So immediately, we're missing that from the picture. The trouble is that this is actually the basis of, by which national income is measured. It's the basic diagram from which national income counting is done. What a country's gross national income is and whether a country's economy is growing or not is measured from this part only. And as we know, the global economy is projected to grow and grow. So we've seen since 1970 only, it's quadrupled inside and expected to quadruple again on mainstream predictions as if this would bring us everything we needed. But we know that economic growth does not bring with it all the parts of human life and well-being that we care about. Even when the economy has grown to 2030, one billion people are still projected to live in absolute deprivation. We are fully aware of the degradation implied by um, en you know, enduring economic growth. And really interestingly, that recently much more debate has been put on the question of inequality. And a fascinating statistic in 2010, when the US economy started to grow again, 93% of the growth in the US economy that year was captured by the top 10% of society. So huge questions of how is this, this wave of economic growth being distributed through society and is it benefiting us? Is this what we want? So it's not surprising that our politicians, aware of these major caveats in the paradigm that we live in, when they come to talk about economic growth, they're often searching for words. And, and if you listen to what they say recently, it's more and more caveated. So David Cameron has called for balanced growth, Angela Merkel for strong and sustained growth, Obama for long and lasting growth, Barroso for smart, sustainable, inclusive and resilient growth. <laughs> and all these caveats, it reminds me, you know, if you go into a deli and you want a sandwich, and there's just too many choices. What kind of sandwich do you want? And it makes me think, you know, what kind of growth would you like today? Because these words are all words that are currently being used to describe the economic growth that we're seeking in our societies. There's something exciting about that. Because when politicians who are captured within that paradigm of talking about growth, it's very difficult for them to step outside of it. But when they have to use so many terms to describe what it is they want, to me, it's the sense of a paradigm that's ready to fall because these words aren't working for us anymore. We're scrabbling around for something else. So it's actually an exciting time to come up with alternative paradigms. And indeed, when uh, President Sarkozy of France commissioned some Nobel Prize winning economists to come up with a report on alternatives to GDP, it was led by Marty Sen, Joseph Stiglitz, very respected economists. They came up with their report and they said, those attempting to guide the economy in our societies are like a pilot trying to steer without a reliable compass. Acknowledging at the heart that this idea of GDP is not the compass that we need. So how can these politicians steer us to where we want to get to with such poor metrics that fail to reflect so much of what we value in life? So what if we could actually put in their hands the kind of compass that they need, the kind of compass that would actually help us guide ourselves and those economic students through the 21st century? So I'm going to propose to you one compass that we could use. And I want to help get these politicians away from the very short-term focus on this quarter's GDP growth and get into a much longer-term perspective. 
So let's, when we're going to go for long term, let's really go for the long term. This is 100,000 years on this planet, and this is a measure of the temperature of the planet. And what you can see is it's varied hugely over time, and then just in the last 10 to 12,000 years, it's been remarkably stable. And this is the geological era known as the Holocene. And it's no coincidence that all the great civilizations rose up during this phase. It's no coincidence that this is when humanity began to practice agriculture, and we began to harness the resources that now had a stability around us that we could then use and multiply food supply and create civilizations. So this is a pretty precious phase of the planet's history. And it prompted Johan Rockström at the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden to say, with a group of his colleagues, well, what is it about this phase? I mean, what, what are the defining conditions about the Holocene? Because it would be quite good to know what they are before we kick ourselves out of it. And it's really interesting that it was just now, just right, you know, this was in 2009, just in the last couple of years that scientists have started asking this question about the planet. Because it's, you know, since the 14th century, we have been asking ourselves questions about the human body as a system. How do all these different parts interact? The blood supply with the digestive system, the nervous system, breathing system. And what limits of pressure can we put on the human body? How hot can it get before it collapses? How long can you go without water? How fast can you run? How fast can you make your heart beat? What are the limits of pressure for human well-being? And we've become quite masterful at this system, which is why we are so many and why our health has ex increased extraordinarily over the last century. But it's only just now that scientists are asking the same kind of question about the planet. What are all the different parts of the system? How do they interact? And what are the limits of pressure we can put on them before they go into a completely changed state? So luckily, we don't have medieval doctors on the case. We have 21st century scientists with 21st century technologies, finding out pretty rapidly, but we're on a very, very fast catch-up game here to figure out the fundamental systems of the planet before we indeed push ourselves out of it. And Rockstrom and co, around 30 Earth system scientists, said, we think there are nine critical planetary boundaries that we need to respect. And these are climate change, so you know, not too many greenhouse gases that we actually change the climate. Not so many uh, fresh water withdrawals from the oceans and, and, sorry, from the rivers and lakes that we actually change the hydrological cycle and change the recharge underground. Um, ensure that we don't put so much nitrogen and phosphorus through fertilizers, particularly that leaches out into the sea and causes eutrophication, which kills off um, sea life. Not allowing the oceans to acidify, particularly with uh, dissolving carbon dioxide in it, that again, it kills the coral, it kills the fish, it kills the chain of life in the oceans. Chemical pollution, all sorts of chemicals, whether it's from plastics to nuclear waste, that we don't actually know how they're going to interact with living systems. So this is a big area of unknown. Atmospheric aerosol loading, so putting so many particulates out in the, in the atmosphere that they actually change monsoon patterns. Ozone depletion, that's a story we know, and, and may, you know, we've created a huge hole over the ozone because of CFCs, and it's a, it's a success story because we've actually come back within that uh, danger zone, we think, on ozone. So that's one we always look to is, you know, we've done this. Biodiversity loss, so you've got massive monoculture versus a biodiverse uh, forest. And of course, when you lose diversity, you lose the resilience of diversity. And likewise, land use change. If we change the natural cover of the land surface, we are, again, losing that diversity and resilience. So we're weakening the Earth's resilience to changes in the other areas. And of course, these things all interact, but we don't yet know fully how. And the scientists said, we want to draw up some boundaries. We believe that there are tipping points or critical, critical thresholds over which we do not want to go on these nine systems. And we don't know exactly where they are, but we're going to try and make a first estimate of that. And so the tipping point, you know, this here is a tipping point, right, on, down this waterfall. You don't want to go down that waterfall. But this guy is too close. So the tipping point itself is that particular biophysical threshold you don't want to go over. The boundary is a safe space away from it. He's gone over the boundary. Okay, so the boundary is the safety zone that you want to stay away from. It's not the tipping point itself. So they tried to say, where are these boundaries on our, on our best understanding of science? Where do we think they are? And they, they tried to um, you know, draw them on a graph. So you, what you can see is that we are over the boundary on three of these. Climate change. So they estimate the boundaries at 350 parts per million. We know that we're over 400 parts per million. Everybody's talking about that. But there are others too. Nitrogen. This, if this graph were complete, it would go you know, about out to here. We're three or four times over what they estimate as a safe nitrogen boundary. 
which is around 35 million tonnes of reactive nitrogen released into the atmosphere per year. And biodiversity loss, 10 times over. That would hit the other side of the window if the graph continued. Massively over biodiversity loss. And on the other ones, these orange areas, for which they, they couldn't um, quantify two of them, but on the other ones, we're moving towards the boundaries. So there's a picture that we are over these planetary boundaries. And I was incredibly excited the first time I saw this diagram um, because I felt that there, in that, in that picture, which they called a safe operating space for humanity, if we can stay inside it, we're in this safe operating space. I was very excited because I felt there is that box called the environment drawn around the economy. You know, I, I, what I saw was these Earth system scientists saying to economists, well, if you won't draw the picture of the box around the economy, we're going to draw it for you. And we're going to draw it in our metrics. So you're going to have to deal with somebody else's metrics now. It's not all stated in monetary terms. You've got to learn some other metrics. You've got to get a bit interdisciplinary here. So I was very excited and I thought, OK, where's the social justice story in this too? If that's what natural science and, and environmental limits are saying to the economy, what is it coming based in Oxfam, what can we say from social justice? And I looked at that and I thought, well, that whole space might be a safe operating space for humanity. And, and if this point at the middle is kind of pristine Holocene when humanity made no impact on the Holocene state. And each of these radials is taking you out towards, right, it's like nine little graphs together, taking you out towards the boundary. But I thought, but that space in the middle, I mean, that's where humanity is making no impact on the planet. That's a place of death because we use resources as an animal. We are, we are resource users. We all had breakfast. We all had lunch and dinner. We use resources to get here. We use resources to thrive. So that space in the middle is actually an extremely dangerous space, especially for people who are living in absolute poverty. So we don't want to be in the middle. This whole place is not equal. If we care also about human well-being, there are limits to that as well. So I added in this center space. So just as there are outer limits of resource use beyond which we don't want to go, there are also inner limits of resource use because of human rights. Every human being has a claim on using resources to meet their human rights. Um, and so just as there's an environmental ceiling, there's also a social foundation. And we don't want to be in this space in here because this is a space of deprivation for humanity. So I thought, well, what, how could we fill in these? You know, they got together, the world's leading Earth system scientists to come up with these nine. How could we fill this in? This was in the run-up to Rio. So I got all the governments of the world's submissions to Rio and went through them and picked out every single social issue that they were mentioning. So it was like crowdsourcing from the world's governments. And there were these 11 issues that were mentioned by more than half of the governments. So they became a sort of illustrative social foundation. So every human being has a claim to using the resources they need to meet their rights to health and food, to water, to have income, education, to be resilient, to have social voice in society, to have a job, access to energy, to have, live in social equity, and to have gender equality. And some of these, of course, are more resource using than others, and they're interrelated. So if you invest in education, you can help people achieve many of these others, just like the Earth system, the human system and its dimensions are related. So rather than having a circle, which is a safe space for humanity, we've got a donut. That's the donut. And it's a safe and just space for humanity. It's an environmentally safe space and a socially just space. And it shows that the, the task of using the planet's resources is not, not just a limit, it's a balancing act, ensuring that all 7 billion of us today moving towards 9 or 10 billion in the future, have the resources we need to meet our human rights, but that collectively we do that within the boundaries of this one planet. So it's an incredibly simple picture. And it puts in place the fundamental environmental goals and values and the fundamental social goals and values. And then it says, ah, the economy is this thing that fits in the space in between. So then it derives an economy and says, well, whatever policies and um, economic system fits in here is what would be inclusive and sustainable economic development. So it's taking the economy off its pedestal and saying, let's talk about the values first and then ask what kind of economic system would take us there. And now we, we can have a much more interesting conversation. But just as the planetary boundary scientist said, where are we in relation to those limits? I said, well, where are we in relation to the social boundary limits? So I used UN data to find out what we could say about them and I could do it for eight of the, of the 11. Let me take, for example, food. So the orange area is the percentage of people in the world who have enough of that basic um, claim to the resource. And the blue area is people who are still living in deprivation. So 13% of people worldwide, according to the FAO, are malnourished. They do not have enough food to eat. 
Uh, 19% of people don't have access to electricity and 39% of people have no access to modern cooking services, so they're cooking over fire, fires and breathing in dangerous smoke. So you can see that on all of these dimensions that we could measure, we are under the social foundation. People are living in deprivation. So we put the two together. We are over the planetary boundaries and moving towards them in other areas. Well, several billion people are still living under the social foundation. And to me, that, that pairing is an indictment of the path of global development that we followed to date, that we've popped ourselves beyond the planet's means while millions still haven't even reached the most basic requirements. And that's a pretty depressing picture. Right? So let me tell you some good news. Uh, people often look at that and think, ooh, but what if all those people got food? And what, you know, that the fear of people getting out of poverty, this would put huge pressure on the planet. Well, the really good news is that is not what would put pressure on the planet. Because if we say, okay, what would it take? How much food is needed to get all those people out of hunger? It would take 3% of the current global food supply. And I put that against the fact that around 30 to 50% of the current food supply is either lost post-harvest, wasted in the supply chain, or thrown away. So we're looking for 10% of what's not even being eaten. Or if we look here at electricity access, what would it take to get access to electricity to everybody in the world? Well, the um, International Energy Agency did an assessment of that, and they said using a mix of technologies, some solar, some other renewables, and some fossil fuels, we could get access to electricity, a basic level of electricity access to every person in the world with a 1% increase in global carbon emissions. And that is fantastically good news, because it means if you're passionate about tackling climate change, you can be passionate about that at the same time as passionate about ending energy poverty people. These are separate issues and this is not the place where you would start. You know, you say, we want to tackle climate change. These people cannot have access to electricity. That's not where you go, because this is not the cause of the problem. So then it begs the question, well, where is it you want to go? It's not going to be a surprise. Let's go back to the planetary boundary picture. So there's the climate change wedge, global emissions. And I've cut it in half, because researchers at Princeton University estimate that around half of global emissions are produced in the name of 11% of people globally. I call them the global carbonistas, because they're in every country. Um, leading very carbon-intensive lifestyles. So this is the place where we want to start cutting global carbon emissions, not saying people living in poverty can't have access to electricity. Likewise, if you look at the nitrogen budget, if we actually were to be within the sustainable nitrogen budget, one-third of that sustainable budget is currently being used to produce animal feed to make meat for Europe. So again, we need to start saying, OK, there's some transformation required here if the whole world is going to fit within that nitrogen budget. So if I just go back to this overall picture, if that is, you know, I, I would propose that is one compass we could use to guide ourselves through the 21st century. I mean, if this century could bring us back into that space from the planetary boundaries and get everybody out of that deprivation, it would be an amazing century. And then you can ask yourself, well, what are the major critical factors that determine whether or not we can get in there? What's the total population? That's obviously an important question. What kind of technologies are being used? How can we increase the efficiency of resource use? How can we redistribute resource use? What kind of governance do we need to get there? And what kind of economic structure? And with that economy being a growing economy or no post-growth economy? So many questions that are important for defining how on earth we could get into that space. But it's that fundamental shift of paradigm. It's a very different starting point than the circular flow of goods and money that today's economists are facing, which is just this is how it works. This is starting with values. These are the fundamental values we want to achieve. Now let's think about designing an economic system to get there. I mean, imagine if we could sit down at a table and, and think about our own lives in relation to those boundaries. How am I living as a consumer and the way I shop, I buy, I travel, I vote? How does it affect people's ability to achieve that social foundation, and what pressure am I putting on the planetary boundaries? How could I say I'm bringing my lifestyle into that space in between the two? What if every company sat down around a board table to think about its corporate strategy and said, what pressure are we putting on these boundaries, and how can we be a company that is moving into that donut space? I've been presenting this to some companies that are actually really interested in using this as a starting point for thinking about where their critical pressures are and where they could make a change. And what if it wasn't just companies voluntarily sitting at that table, but there was legislation that required companies to think like this? What a transformation that would be. And what if when the world's governments met at the United Nations, 
That's not actually the United Nations. <laughs> but <laughs> that's Dr. Strangelove. But what if when the, world's, when the world's governments met at the UN, they did sit around a table that looked like that? I presented this at the UN last year. And I said, you need a new conference table. If you had these values and these ideas in front of you, would it make you negotiate from a different place? Would you think about not short-term national self-interest, but long-term collective global interest? Would it not change the conversations that we would have? Because many people, again, are coming almost unaware with that economic paradigm in the back of their head, and it's, it's getting in the way of progress. So we can, we can transform our personal lives. We can transform companies. We could transform the UN with, with a better paradigm like this. But I'm still worried about these guys, these economic students, because they're not seeing this. They're still looking at the circular flow of goods and money. So I know some people like to play fantasy football. I like to play fantasy economics and think, if you could actually rewrite the curriculum that they were going to learn from, what would you put into it? And there's a wonderful quote that I've been referring to often when I give this presentation. It happens to be from Schumacher, so it's very nice to present it here. What matters is the toolbox of ideas with which, by which, through which we experience and interpret the world. So that toolbox, that when we go to university and we entrust our minds to those university curricula, what, are we being, what is going into that toolbox? So I play fantasy economics by thinking, okay, what would I put in the toolbox if I could start constructing a new toolbox. So first things I would chuck in, I would put in the, the, this is a map, the beginnings of a new understanding of the system, of the economy in society, in the environment, starting a new starting point for understanding the terrain. And I put in a compass. These are the goals, right? So a map of what it looks like and the goals of where we want to get to as a starting point. And then I'm just going to show you sort of six ideas of things that I put in. And I would love to know what you would put in this toolbox. So... That's a, that's a shoal of fish. And I would put that in because like a shoal of fish, the economy and society is a complex adaptive system. right? And so it's, it's got properties, emergent properties, that cannot be predicted from the behavior of any one of its parts. So we've got to bring in systems thinking and complexity analysis, totally absent from my own education, but thankfully very much rising up as, as a way of thinking, very prevalent here. Starting from that point, understanding complexity, resilience, redundancy, uh, emergent properties. Secondly, I'd say, well, humanity, we're not like fish, but also we're not rational economic man. We don't put our utility at the front and maximise our personal utility and have solid long-term enduring preferences and compete with others to maximise those. We're complicated. We follow rules, we form habits, we follow the crowd. You can nudge us one way or the other. And we don't think, do things only out of self-interest. We do things out of mutual aid or cooperation and collaboration and altruism. So there's a much more interesting opportunity to understand human psychology. And behavioral econom and economics is beginning to talk about this. But putting that much more interesting person, which is us, into the thinking of economics. Thirdly, putting values and social justice front and center if you look back at the old writings of John Stuart Mill and even Adam Smith, it was full of values. These were people who would write books about economics and then next week turn away and write a book about morals and social philosophy. It was embedded for them and it's become totally separated. So put their values back at the heart of the debate. I have personally been incredibly struck by how much resonance this little picture has had. It's just a little drawing. And I'm amazed by how much people have said, you know, we want to use this and we help because it's about values and thank goodness we can put them back on the table and now we can talk about the economic system we want. So we're dying for values to come back into the debate. So values, inequality, social equity, human rights, how can we bring that into economic thinking? Next, much more interesting thinking about governance of resources because the governance debate um, is too easily claimed by economics. Well, what you need to do is assign property rights and then... They, the markets will manage it. But we know that there are many common resources that we don't want to assign private property rights to. They're commonly held. And the work of Eleanor Ostrom is really interesting around this, looking at um, common pool resources and other ways that we can manage and successfully manage these, these shared, uh, shared resources. So much more subtle thinking about different forms of governance of resources. And then lastly, more interesting thinking about money. Uh, we, we live in a monoculture of money where it's an interest-bearing currency and it's one currency only. There are so many other ways you could construct a currency that cause people to behave differently. But we're so used to that monoculture, it's hard to see. Who makes the money and how does that money make us behave and how could we reformulate that? 
And then lastly, I would throw in a new dashboard because the single indicator dashboard of GDP isn't useful. We need a, a wider set of indicators, multi-metrics, just like the, the compass over there, the donut, requires us to think in multiple metrics. We need to find ways of getting policymakers to have a more nuanced debate around the multi-metrics and societies to engage in thinking around the multi-metrics of what well-being looks like. Again, there's really interesting initiatives around this going on. The OECD themselves are doing some interesting work on better living and, and having multiple metrics. But if you go to university and study economics now, you are not being taught that. The mindset is the same, and it's not equipping students. So the students aren't actually getting this toolbox. Um, at least most of them aren't. And I know I presented it as fantasy economics, but of course it's actually reality economics, because these are, are reality starting points for redesigning economics. I have to say that when I was first invited to come here and be presented as part of this course, I looked at the curriculum and I thought, they're doing the toolbox, you know? This is, this is where it's happening. The Economics for Transition degree here is precisely looking at all these things. So it's not even fantasy economics here. It's very exciting that Schumacher is very cutting edge about rewriting that economics toolkit. But I'm still worried about those students who are encountering this diagram and having the old paradigm put in their head. We don't have time for them to spend 20 years like I had to do to realize that this old paradigm ain't going to serve them or the world and to re-educate themselves. So that's where I ask you for the pen. This is the guerrilla campaign. So the campaign is you go into the office of every economics professor you know, into every economic student, the libraries, and you get out that macroeconomic textbook and you open it on the page with this diagram and just you take your pen and you draw in <laughs> the environment and you draw in the unpaid care economy and you draw in social exchange and you're going to cause some very confused questions coming from the back of the, the class you know the professor is going to get really pissed off about this diagram but with that you know those few strokes of the pen we can change the visual paradigm that so many students are being taught in economics and we can transform the thinking and start moving towards a much richer paradigm that we know we need to achieve. I am discussing these issues and blogging about it, and I would love, if you're interested, to join me there and have that debate. Uh, but I will leave you with the donut, and I would love to discuss now with you, is this a useful way of setting a compass for the 21st century, and what would you want to put in that toolbox? Thank you very much. <laughs>